I do have that. That's there on my screen. I can't move it, but I can see it. So let us okay. get let us begin. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am experiencing some computer difficulties, as you may have noticed, uh, but we will proceed to, uh, along. Um, I would like to welcome Carl Nafee. Uh, he is the UK Public Relations and Strategic Communications. Um, Carl is now in his 32nd year as a member of the staff at the University of Kentucky Public Relations and Marketing Office. Uh, he is involved with much of the office broadcast media output, including producing and hosting UK at the Half, a two and a half minute radio feature about people and programs at the university, which airs during every live episode or statewide radio broadcast of UK football and basketball games on the UK Sports Network. In addition, Carl often serves as Master of Ceremonies at UK news conferences. Sorry, had another disruption, but I think we may be back in line now. I don't know what just happened, so uh, let me continue. Uh, uh, at commencement every May and December, Nathie reads the names of each graduating seniors just before they shake the hand of President Eli Capolito as they walk across the stage. The 2021 season of UK football will mark Nathie's 25th year serving as the public address announcer at Kroger Field for the Kentucky Wildcats. He also handles PA announcing for the Kentucky High School Athletic Association state football finals in all six classes at Kroger Field and serves as host and sideline reporter for KHSAA and KU Sweet 16 Network, that's radio and online for the boys and the girls state basketball tournaments each year. And Carl serves as a starter announcer at the PGA Tours Barbasol Championship at Keene Trace in Nicholasville each July. Carl served on the board of the Kentucky Broadcasters Association as director of associate members in the 1990s. Together with Bernie Vonderheide, and with the support of the KBA board, he established the Harry Barfield College Scholarship Awards Program and served as its director for 26 years from 91 to 2017. Carl was honored by the KBA in 2012 when he was presented with the Al Temple Award for long and dedicated service to the organization. He is parishioner at Mary Queen of the Holy Rosary Catholic Church. And he and his wife, Ellen, reside in Lexington. They have three adult children, a daughter-in-law, and two grandsons. So join me in welcoming Carl. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you very much, David. And you might say I wrote that myself, and I actually <laughs> did. <laughs> but no, it's, a, it's always humbling when, when you hear some things. But I've had a, I have a good and lucky life in terms of communications and broadcasting. I'll just recap briefly my own background. I grew up in Pleasantville, New York, which is about an hour north of Midtown Manhattan, about 45 minutes from Yankee Stadium. Uh, early on, when I was four and a half years old, the Halls moved in next door. Mr. Hall was a former minor league baseball player. He raised his sons to be athletes, and they were both good athletes. Went on to play in college, not at the major college level, but anyway, I got indoctrinated into sports very early. My dad was not a big sports fan, but through the halls and through uh, my uh, great mother, who was like a saint, uh, took me sometimes to games at Yankee Stadium and so forth when I was seven, eight, nine years old. When I got a little older, I started to go myself, of course. A big sports fan, love uh, basically all sports, and uh, it's been part of my life. Now, I graduated from the University of Maryland College Park. I was the youngest of four in our family. I'm the only one who went out, out of state to school. I studied broadcast journalism there at the University of Maryland and really was hoping to have a career in sports broadcasting. And I did that for about 15 years. I worked for a radio station in Rockland County, New York for several years. That was near where I grew up. Then I got a television job, sports job out in Casper, Wyoming, about 2,000 miles west of where I grew up. Talk about a little culture and uh, uh, altitude change, in fact, as well, because it's uh, Denver's known as the Mile High City. Well, Casper is just under a mile high, about 5,180 feet. 
above the sea level in Casper. And then I was there from 81 to 85. I got a sports job at WLEX TV in Lexington and came in the late fall of 85 and was there until the fall of 89. The thing about sports broadcasting and you start having a family, the hours of television and radio news and sports aren't exactly family friendly. So I was kind of looking to something where I could put my experience to work. And even though it wasn't directly with sports, I dealt a lot with dealing with the media, both as part of it and knowing what media are up against. And I applied for a job in public relations, what's now public relations and strategic communications at the University of Kentucky. Bernie Vonderheide was the longtime director there. Uh, I served my first eight years under Bernie until he retired. He was there a total of 23 years. And I feel like I got an advanced degree in public relations and communications under Bernie, just observing him, working for him, and learning from him. Uh, one of my beats over these last number of years, I've had uh, several, and we have a beat system in our office where each person covers a different part of the university, uh, staffs it, and does uh, stories about and so forth. One of my beats was the UK College of Agriculture, Food, and Environment. Another one was the Gatton College of Business and Economics, and also the Martin School of Public Policy and Administration. And this presentation, as I say, is just going to be what I've kind of learned through the years. And it's probably going to be pretty basic, but I, I believe that the fact that people have media experience prior to getting to public relations and communications can be a real strength. That's not possible for everyone, and more and more, uh, we're getting people on our staff coming up who have majored in communications and even specialized in public rela relations at University of Kentucky and other universities, but they've often served as interns in our office. And they might serve for inter internship for one semester or two, and they'll get the feel of what it's all about. Uh, University of Kentucky's public relations efforts are piloted by Jay Blanton, who is the chief communications officer, and he's an assistant vice president. Tom Harris is a vice president for university relations. Jay reports to him. And uh, Jay does have a seat at the table uh, with uh, Eli Capilouto and others and Tom Harris in planning communications uh, at the University of Kentucky. Uh, he's also the one that you'll see his name in the paper or online or see him on television or hear him on radio talking about what the university's doing. And Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Jay has been front and center explaining what the university has been doing. But we have other people also involved in that effort. Uh, Jay has built a real team atmosphere at the UK Public Relations Office, and I give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, he never asks anybody to do anything that he hasn't already done himself or wouldn't be willing to pitch in on. So uh, I have a lot of respect for Jay, and he's a, he's a great boss. Which, by the way, uh, just so you know, uh, if you don't hear my name out there very much, uh, as much as it used to be, it's because I'm working part-time. The last couple of years, I went to part-time status as of July 2019, but I'm still engaged with the university and, uh, as was mentioned by David in the introduction, have hosted UK at the Half for many years and done other things and still do some podcasts on behalf of the university. But one of the things I was asked to talk about this morning was what UK has been doing through out the COVID-19 pandemic. And obviously UK has worked to communicate quickly and efficiently with various stakeholders. Uh, stakeholders meaning students, faculty, staff, parents, alums, anybody that's got anything to do with the University of Kentucky. Another important thing, and all, all of you have heard this, I'm sure in some sort of seminar or during your education or in your offices you've discussed this, but you can never, I don't believe, you can ever over-communicate, nor should you ever overlook your internal audiences. Sometimes communicators have the reputation of being great at communicating with the outside world, but not within their own organization. I compliment David and Charlie and all of you that are in the Kentucky Association of Government Communicators because you have a chance to share best practices and share ideas and compare notes with one another. I think that's very important. But don't ignore the people, for instance, at the University of Kentucky, we have literally thousands of people working at the university, either as staff people or as professors or as doctors, physicians, and others in UK healthcare. 
And if you keep those people in, involved and knowing what the university is doing and why it is doing it, they can become advocates for you instead of being uh, perhaps if they don't hear about things and they hear about it after the fact, being a net negative, but they can be a positive force for the university. Early on in the pandemic, UK created a specific website for all of our COVID communication, and that's uky.edu slash coronavirus, uky.edu slash coronavirus. Also, they started a blog, we started a blog called Data DL to share regular updates on our COVID-19 response with the campus and the community. Again, keeping your internal constituents up to date on what's going on. The blog was created in partnership with institutional research, analytics and decision support, and usually focused on data surrounding COVID-19 on campus. Before I go any further, I'm 68 years old, I kind of know some basics in social media and online communication. We've got some very bright young people, thank goodness, that do a bang up job for us in that part of our communications efforts. But do not ignore social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and so forth. It's very important. You need every means of communication you can to get the word out. Used to be when I started working at the University of Kentucky Public Relations Office, they were just in the process from shifting on mailing out news releases each week in a packet. And we thought it was a big advancement that we were faxing things out so you could get them almost instantly. Well, that has evolved to where it's a whole different world now, as you know, and things happen very fast. But social media, I'm no expert, but I know it's very important. And, and I did visit with some of the members of our team to get some of this information that I could bring to you about what we've been doing during the pandemic. So uh, the blog was one thing, having the specific uky.edu slash coronavirus website. And then when communicating with students, concentrate on social media as well as email. Now through all these various channels, the messaging has been focused on practicing healthy behaviors, masking up, washing hands, physically distancing, and completing their daily screening, which is done via your little cell phone here. And uh, that is the easiest way, your, your handheld device, whatever you're doing, uh, you can do it online, you can do it via uh, uh, on your desktop computer, your laptop, whatever. But basically it's a daily reminder for everybody to keep doing what we're supposed to be doing during COVID-19. Uh, also, the students were required to complete a monthly COVID-19 test on campus, and they've been involved from the get-go on how to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, we have had a mobile site set up uh, under the stands at Kroger Field. Uh, we have some nice uh, rooms there that uh, the athletics made available to us, and we are now up to nearly 240,000 COVID vaccines since that uh, clinic went online at Kroger Field in January. Now you may have read or heard that as of yesterday, the Board of Trustees meeting, Eric Monday, who is one of our vice presidents, said that very soon it will be uh, phased out of that mobile clinic and all the vaccines will be shifted to regular UK healthcare operations. But anybody that you know that doesn't have a vaccine, uh, I'm probably preaching to the choir. If you haven't been vaccinated yet or gotten the full uh, two doses, if it's the Pfizer or the Moderna, or if you haven't gotten the Johnson & Johnson, anyway, the, the uh, Pfizer and Moderna are very much available through the University of Kentucky. And uh, just go on that website, uky.edu slash coronavirus. But uh, I'm a firm believer myself in uh, communicating that effort to people. I've been fully vaccinated. It's very important uh, trying to come out of this pandemic. That's my, my opinion. I know there's others that sometimes uh, uh, have different opinions. Uh, in addition to getting the word out about the, the monthly tests that we did with students and getting the COVID-19 vaccine since that's been available, we also send any student email communication that parents should be aware of to those who are signed up to be on our UK parent email list. Uh, in addition to all of that, 
We have our news website, which we call UK Now, which you can go to uky.edu slash UK Now, U-K-N-O-W, as well as email and Facebook Live, uh, communicating all of our responses uh, to the COVID-19, to faculty, staff, parents, and uh, President Campoluto, who himself is a great believer in communication, has written frequent email updates throughout the pandemic and continues to do so uh, regarding the vaccination efforts. So again, these efforts are shared with faculty, staff, parents, as well as students across the university. Uh, the thing that I wanna stress in, in my basic message is communicate, communicate, communicate. And I think we've learned through this pandemic, the value of having that constant communication, keeping people in the loop. Uh, if there's anything that is, is a, a challenge in our society today, it is some of the things, some of the ugly rumors and uh, misinformation that can get out there that sometimes goes unchallenged on social media. And by communicating and constantly communicating and clarifying if there's any questions, uh, you can help uh, temper that. Again, preaching to the choir, this isn't exactly uh, uh, breaking news. Uh, it's pretty basic, I know that. A uh, couple of other points that I wanna mention. Uh, one of the things is follow up and follow through. Do what you say you're going to do. Now, if you have a website that's going to update people on the coronavirus situation, for instance, for the University of Kentucky, well, you've got to have somebody who's constantly updating that. Uh, I think we all found out in the early days of uh, people would create a website, and then if you don't constantly service it, People go to it and say, well, this website last updated February of 2021, and now it's May the 5th, 2021. That's not going to impress anybody. you got to have, if you're going to do something, whether it's email, Facebook, Instagram, you're going to have a website, any kind of communication, a blog, you've got to pay attention to it. Otherwise, it's not worth the, uh, I was going to say the paper it's printed on, but we don't print as much as we used to, so that's not a very good analogy. But I think you get the drift of what I'm saying. Follow up and follow through. Uh, another thing is uh, never assume anything. Uh, I think in the communications business, we sometimes we think, well, well, I emailed Charlie or I emailed David, so I'm sure we're good on that. Or I sent them a text message or I left them a voicemail. If it's something important, go ahead and confirm it, either with a phone call or a text, hey, did, David, did you get my text? Charlie, did you get my email? You might be mildly annoying, but I'm, I'm of the opinion that uh, assume, okay, saying that I assume that something got done, that's a word that should be struck from the English language, at least as far as if you're in communication. Never assume anything. Early on in my radio career, one of my uh, duties, in addition to being a sportscaster and doing some disc jockey work and some news work was we had commercial production. It was a small radio station. Charlie would know about this, but you, you cut radio spots. Uh, there might be some local uh, supermarket or whatever. And we had other fellows that were other fellows and gals that were on the air. And uh, about three of us were involved in producing radio spots when we weren't uh, actually doing an air shift. So we do that for maybe an hour or two each day and, and cut new spots to make sure they stayed up to date on the air. And the general manager one day called me into his office and said, Carl, uh, I heard that spot. You're supposed to be running the new one. I thought I assigned you to do that. What happened? And I said, and I'll just mention his first name, John. I said, Mr. Siegel, I thought, I assumed John had taken care of that. Uh, he, he told me at that meeting, he said, Carl, never assume anything. Pretty much since then, I haven't. And that was about 45 years ago. So that'll tell you how I feel about that. Redundancy, I don't mean micromanaging. I don't mean being a pain in the neck. But I mean, you make sure that your message got through to the person you want to get it through to. Doesn't hurt to build relationships with the media, of course, that you're dealing with. Uh, you want to make sure they're getting your messaging. 
and they might even have some uh, suggestions to you on how best to get that word to them. But but stay in touch with people. Uh, another thing is, in, in terms of a, a, a big picture, uh, most of you, I imagine, uh, if you're the Kentucky Association of Government Communicators, you're working for somebody that is representing uh, either a cabinet or a department in Frankfurt or across the state, or it could be a, a variety of ways that you might be involved with the organization. But media training, especially if you have a CEO that is going to be uh, out communicating and being the face of your organization, if it's the governor of Kentucky, if it's a cabinet secretary, if it's somebody who's an, uh, another officer, but anybody that's going to be interviewed by the media on a regular basis, I think it's a great idea to have them undergo some media training. There's different resources out there. You can hire professionals to do it. But I think most of us, you can figure out uh, some media training tips yourself. But practice. The other thing is, if you yourselves are the one that might be on camera or uh, being interviewed on the phone or whatever the situation is by a newspaper, by an online source. Practice on one another. For instance, if I was going to be interviewed this afternoon and maybe I work alongside David and maybe I say, hey, David, uh, how about we, we talk about this issue and then let's do a practice interview. So I want to be ready for anything. Uh, this could, And this is the same kind of thing you can do with your CEO, uh, but preparation is I think a key. Uh, you want to be yourself. You you want to be real. You want to be obviously. You got to be honest. Uh, but what you want to do is be prepared so that you don't go off on some tangent or uh, maybe enlighten people in some way that you didn't intend to. Uh, one example of that for media training that uh, Ken Kurtz, who for a long time was the news director at Channel Twenty Seven WKYT. TV in Lexington. And I've had a chance to work with Ken over the years a couple times on media trainings, and he came up with something, as far as I know, it's his original idea, and it's called sex. But it's not S-E-X, it's S-E-C-S, -S, sex. Statement, evidence, conclusion, shut up. You make the statement, you give the evidence to support it, you make your concluding comment and you shut up. Another thing in media training that often you'll learn if you haven't already, and I'm sure you, you, many of you have practiced this with some of your CEOs and people that are out there in the public, don't be afraid. If you're being interviewed, this is a particularly uh, appropriate for television interviews. If you're being in, interviewed for television, don't be afraid of silence. Sometimes a reporter will ask a question You'll give an appropriate, maybe it'll be 15 to 20 second answer, and you're finished. And the reporter might just sit there looking at you with that kind of a pregnant pause, kind of a waiting for you to say something else. And that's exactly what that person's often trying to do, is to get you to go into something else. Like you're thinking, oh, they weren't satisfied with that answer. I've got to tell them more. And then you start going down some road that you didn't want to go down. So a little acronym, statement, evidence, conclusion, shut up. I think it's a good one. Uh, never, never speculate. No, that's a, ba base, a basic one. But if you don't know something, don't pretend to know it. Never speculate. Uh, the, there's, a, there's a saying now, you, uh, what, is, what is it? I've seen it on commercials and whatnot. But hey, and this applies to women too, so don't be offended by, by, the, by the, uh, the short term. But uh, uh, stay in your lane, bro. Stay in your lane, bro. Don't. In other words, if you're confident and you know what you're talking about, that's fine. But if you don't, say if if David was the reporter, uh, David, I don't know that. I'm going to have to. I'll have to get back to you on that. Let me let me see if I can't find somebody that can help answer that question. Don't try to answer it when you don't know how to answer it. Uh, one other one other thing that I uh, I wrote down in preparation for this and I hope we're all right on time. Uh, there are times when I believe at least that a, a statement, a, a statement that is, that is posted, that is released, is sometimes the appropriate way to answer questions on a particular issue 
uh, when you don't want a, a CEO to go out there, it might be a, a kind of a situation. Most of the time, most of the time, I think you're better off meeting it directly head on. And, and by making a statement, it doesn't mean that you're not meeting it head on. But what I'm saying is don't get out there with uh, somebody that's ill prepared and it might be a controversial issue, and they might say something or get ahead of the story. Sometimes uh, a, a statement that speaks for uh, what your point is and what your organization's trying to get across to the public is the way to go. Others may disagree with that, but I've seen it at work uh, many times at the University of Kentucky. Um, I'm, I'm going to allow some time for questions, but basically, uh, you know, and I, and I was asked to make up a title, and, and I did say, uh, communicating, whether it's public relations or uh, whether it's doing public address announcing, which is another part of my career. Uh, it's, it's communicate, communicate, communicate. When you're doing public address announcing, as I do for UK football, and I used to do for UK baseball, I've done it for, for just about all the sports at UK at one time or another, at least filling in. And that is, you want to be clear. You want to be correct. And as much as possible, you want to be concise, uh, clear, concise, and correct. Those were the words that were used by Bob Shepard, who was for 51 years the voice of the New York Yankees at Yankee Stadium, the public address voice. Uh, he started uh, that job back in 1951 and uh, was there serving in that job until uh, about 2008 and uh, some health concerns. Uh, he, he was, by the way, he was 96, 97 years old when he did his last active season. So <laughs> he was an amazing guy. But Bob Shepard uh, urged public address announcers to be clear, concise, and correct. Now, having said that, the day and age that we live in, and if you're doing it for a university, you're doing public address announcing for a university, there's a, an element called marketing. and so you probably are not going to be asked to be dry and monotone, but maybe bring a little style along with the substance. The main thing is you want to communicate, in my case, who made the tackle, how many yards were gained, who threw the pass, that kind of thing. And uh, we also have a little bit of, um, shall we say, hot dog in us from time to time. Uh, I, I happen to like saying first down Kentucky or touchdown Kentucky. But you really, when you're a public address announcer, you serve at the pleasure of the people that you're working for, in this case, the University of Kentucky and, and the athletic department. Uh, but there's things that I've been fortunate. One of the most fortunate things that I had was the boss that hired me, Bernie Vonderheide, knew of my background in sports. A, it didn't stop him from hiring me, even though in public relations I was dealing mainly with local news people. But B, he always allowed me, as long as outside my regular hours and I got all my regular work done, to do things like public address announcing and some other things related to sports. So uh, I didn't have to quell my, uh, my interest in sports. And of course, at the University of Kentucky, it's a pretty good place to work if you like sports because we've got a great sports program, uh, athletics program that uh, just recently uh, captured the national championship in volleyball. I'm sure you're all well aware of that. And earlier this year, for the third time, Harry Mullins and the rifle team captured the national championship. So while most of the attention uh, across the state and nationally and, and, and beyond is on the UK men's basketball and UK football programs, UK women's basketball has been doing very well. I think they have a bright future. And athletics director Mitch Barnhart has really emphasized uh, the sports across the board. The so-called Olympic sports gets lots of attention. Uh, the SEC, uh, the women's swimming and diving team won the SEC championship this year. Uh, that was a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, they had several people go to nationals. Uh, we are consistently now, when they come out with the final rankings that uh, uh, Learfield Sports does, where they rank, uh, compare the different universities and how many, uh, how you do across the board in all your sports. We have 22 uh, sports for men and women, 22 if you add them all up for, between the fall, uh, winter, and spring, 22 sports. And we are consistently now in the top 10, top 15, and a 
hopefully getting to the top five in those overall rankings. So uh, Athletics Director Mitch Barnhart has really put a lot of emphasis on being excellent across the board, on and off the field, and in the community. And our student athletes are a point of pride uh, for the University of Kentucky. With that, uh, probably gone about a half hour, and I'd open it up to questions. Uh, I did bring one note, another thing that we have that we're very proud of, and and as I said, I work with the College of Agriculture, Food and Environment, but one of the things that keeps our statewide presence across the Commonwealth of Kentucky is our extension service and uh, UK extension, cooperative extension offices. And uh, for instance, with COVID-19, not only have they been getting the information out to people, but now, for instance, in Laurel County, uh, Henderson County, they have a partnership with state and federal agencies, including FEMA and the Kentucky Division of Emergency Management for setting up community vaccination sites. So another way that the university has been very attentive through this whole process with uh, COVID-19. If anybody has a question, I'll be happy to talk to them. Nothing, yeah. is, off, nothing is off the table. Good. Carl, I know we had a dismal year in basketball, but you know, rifle did well, volleyball did well. Now back to the communications office, if you're talking about being clear and concise, getting things right, getting it accurate, somewhere the decision was made, and maybe I just missed it, that the volleyball championship, they crossed out 2021 and put in 2020. What, what was the thinking there? What am I missing? Well, I'll tell you why, Charlie. Uh what happened is that volleyball is normally, the women's volleyball is a fall sport. They begin uh, training in, in the summer and they'll, they'll start having scrimmages in August. And this year, because of COVID-19, they even had, I think, a couple of matches in August. But what they basically had was a split season. They had a fall season and then they kind of finished the season in the spring. So it, the season, instead of being its normal uh, three and a half or four months of actual schedule, uh, was stretched over about eight months. And uh, I, I wondered the same thing, but that's why they went with the 2020, because normally the NCAA championship that they won here just within the last uh, couple of weeks in April of 2021, it was really for the 2020 season and normally would have been in December of 2020. Yeah, kind of a strange thing. I don't know why they didn't just go 2021, but then you see this year, if they get back on normal, which we're hoping, uh, the championship, the next one, which hopefully will be UK again. Yeah. Uh, by the way, Craig Skinner, fantastic guy, fantastic coach, and uh, very happy for him and his student athletes. We have several future teachers on that team. Uh, five of them are majors in the College of Education. Uh, they all across the board, one of the highest uh, team GPAs, uh, great point averages in, in all the sports at UK. And by the way, I should uh, use this opportunity as a good public relations communicator to say we have 17 consecutive semesters now where the overall GPA going across all the sports, if you take all the student athletes and put them together, the overall GPA is uh, better than a 3.0. That doesn't mean everybody's above the 3.0, but if you mix them all together, and we've got a number of 4.0s on there, uh, with some of the sports, some of the gymnastics, uh, some of the golfers, some of the volleyball players, fantastic students and going on to, uh, and swimmers, divers. A lot of the sports that uh, might not get the attention that football and basketball get, but we've got some some great young people involved in those activities. Who has a question for Carl? I have one, Charlie. So you, you, Carl, you do a, you've done a lot of television and radio and announcing, you know, to over the radio and to fans that are present. Do you consciously recognize that you are speaking to people that can't see and speaking to people that can see? Or does it just kind of happen for you does that make sense like the difference between announcing sports you're on a radio you're you're explaining what happens knowing they can't see verse you're speaking to people that can visually see it 
Well, I tell you, basic difference in terms of television and radio presentations. In television, the play-by-play -play person doesn't have to say near as much as you do on the radio. Radio, you've got to paint the picture, whether it's football, basketball, baseball. Uh, when you've got television, uh, most people can see for themselves. Now, there is a little exception to that. And one thing that's interesting, Kroger Field, uh, we even have now, there is a running uh, board, message board that records or, or um, closed captions everything that I say for the benefit of those that might be in the stadium that can't hear, which is not, it's not too many people, but it's part of the thing of trying to uh, keep up with the, uh, American, uh, the American Disability Act and trying to bring everybody into it, just like uh, you have closed captioning on television programs for people that can't hear. Um, in terms of the, if you are communicating on the radio, and this goes for, I think this is good for news, sports, whatever it be, weather, even though television and radio are so-called mass media, and you might be reaching thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands, and if you're on a national network, millions of people, I believe that the receivers, everybody is receiving the message one at a time. Just like now, I, I can see a bunch of screens on my gallery view here on my iPad. But each of you are receiving the message, whatever I've been saying, and you've all been receiving it one at a time, and it means something a little different to each of you. And I might say there might be people that said, oh, boy, this guy's boring. I've heard it all before. He's just droning on and on. And there might be saying, oh, I hadn't thought of that before, or that's a good refresher. So you never want to, uh, the, the, the guy who probably uh, coined that, that idea, uh, at least that I, I read in, a, in an old broadcast book one time was Arthur Godfrey. He never imagined that he was speaking to millions of people on the radio or on television. He, he, he thought of it, how is this person going to react one at a time? Uh, and, and that's a good way to do it. And the other thing about that is uh, my first uh, broadcasting experience was on the college radio station at the University of Maryland. Well, back then, it was carrier current. The only place you could get it was in the buildings on campus. Brian McFarland knows all about uh, radio and how it, how it works. But back then, uh, who knows? You might have had 50 people listening to you if you were lucky. But if you approach it with the same effort, the same sincerity, and the same preparation as you do, whether you're talking to 50,000 people or you're talking to one, you're going to be more successful. But I think if you can somehow visualize uh, that the message is going to one person at a time, uh, that's, that's the best way to have it. I noticed, I, I hope, is Natasha still there? Well, her screen's on. Well, I was Are just we? hoping, I was going to say, I was hoping that that wasn't a live picture in her background because. I, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, I, take I, I just I just was going to give you a hard time about your snow picture. Uh, we don't I want know. any more of that. That's why, I, that's why I decided to take it off because it's outdated. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We're way past snow and ice. I need a new background. No, that's okay. I, I just, uh, 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 and as far as that goes, as far as spring, we sure have had enough uh, enough rain. But uh, tell me, if, if I might ask some of you, uh, what are some of the, uh, I know what Brian does, for instance, and and Charlie, uh, uh, but what are some of your other career, your careers there, Amy and so forth? What are your positions and who are you dealing with on a daily basis? I'll go. Um, so I work for the city of Lexington in their public information office. <laughs> And we handle the city's um, social media accounts, website. Um, I do a lot of photo work for the city. Um, that's kind of one of my bigger roles there. And we focus, our office focuses more on like the city services and stuff for residents, not so much the mayor's office. She has her separate communications team and they focus mm -hmm. on her messaging. Um, and we focus more on the city overall in the city services there. And you used to work with my husband, Mark Cornelison in the- Oh, indeed, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he, super photographer and a super guy. And uh, 
Yeah, I'm um, fond of him. Yeah, I imagine. And and uh, and how is your little one? Okay. Yeah, she's great. She's great. So yeah. I'll say um, it's been a while, but I think I've been to. Um, a couple events that like we partnered with the city and UK specifically like UK parking stuff like that. Um, and you all did just a really excellent job uh, with the logistics of some of those press conferences as far as, um, you know, making sure the people who were in front of the, the media were just the two or three people who actually had something relevant to say, um, you know, the people you knew were going to get questions from the media and then making sure the media had everything they needed before the press conference start, that their mics were connected, that they had a press release in hand, that they had the, the names of the speakers so they would have the proper spelling of those, um, which I, I want to tip that out to everybody as a photographer. As somebody who has to write those names in a caption, please make sure every, you give everybody the speakers' names. Um, and, and you guys, at, as a team, I think did a really good job handling those press events um, that I got to sneak into. Some so kudos to you all and your team. Well, thank you for your comments. And uh, couldn't as far as what you were saying, couldn't send it better myself. It goes right it, when it comes to hosting an event, not only to identify the speakers, but think of all the little things. Make sure for everybody that's going to be a speaker that you've got a fresh bottle of water or some other, but probably bottled water is the easiest and under every chair of a speaker because the, the, oftentimes we'll get done with a, a news conference and I'm not involved as much as I was when I was full time, but I'm still a little bit involved. But if you, it's kind of like you bring the umbrella, it won't rain. If you bring the water, uh, nobody will have a coughing fit, but if you don't, uh, people will get dry or whatever. Uh, I always would have in my jacket pocket, I always have uh, uh, cough drops. If, uh, President Capaluto once in a while he'd uh, he'd say, "Hey, any chance you got a cough drop?" Or or I might see him before I said, "You know, you need a cough drop." He'd say, "No, I'm fine." But things like the little details, uh, making sure uh, the media knows where to exactly where to go, where to park, make sure that the parking's available. Uh, things can derail a public event. It the, the what's the term the the uh, the devil is in the details. I think I'm saying that right, but details, details, the little things uh, are the things that add up to make an event uh, successful. Anybody else? Who else is uh, out there that, uh, Maxine, uh, what's your day-to-day -day job? Hello? The wrong thing. I'm the deputy oh. director for Bluegrass Green Source. We're a nonprofit environmental education organization based in Fayette County. And we work in 20 counties in central Kentucky. And my day-to-day -day job is meeting with mayors and judges and uh, writing budgets and, and that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. um, I don't have, uh, I, I don't do the writing and that, that most of the people that are in this organization um, does, but uh, you know, mine's more verbal communication with judges and mayors, to what kind of programming they need and, and that type of thing. Very good. Well, uh, it, it, uh, David and, and Charlie, uh, how many uh, people do you have in the uh, members of the Kentucky Association of Government Communicators? I wish I had an exact number. I was uh, presented the other day. Maxine, do well, you I'm, know? Work <laughs> I'm working on that because we've had some people ask because of last year, and I, I finally found a folder that had uh, some forms in it, and I worked on that for a little while this morning. And with the folder that I found, we're somewhere around 50. Very good. So we have, uh, there's several people in, um, you know, last last year uh, was uh, the year where people either uh, maybe didn't pay their dues or or paid and got to count that for this year. So it's uh, I'm trying to put the two lists together now to to find out exactly how many how many people we do have. Very good, very good. Is there anybody else out there that wants to uh, join in? 
Well, this is Natasha with the outdated Zoom background, and I was just going to say I work for the Department of Transportation, uh, District 7, so I'm responsible for public relations, interviews, anything that comes up that needs to be done um, for communications. It's my responsibility. And, of course, that means translating what engineers tell me into layman's terms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so yes. Yes. Yeah, and, and, and I've adjusted, I've been with it so long, I've adjusted to uh, their terminology. So, you know, it's much easier than when I first started this job. Well, one of the things I've often done for, for this is for what it's worth, but one of the things I've often done in interviews is exactly what you just said. Try to present this in layperson's terms, because, for instance, if a professor at the University of Kentucky is an expert on a subject. It, to me, if they're really, he or she is really an expert, they should be able to uh, go to a sophisticated conference where there's other PhDs and other researchers and so forth, be able to talk at that level, but then they should also be able to explain it to people like all of us gathered here today. I don't know, there might be a scientist or some, something among you in the group today, but what I'm saying is that uh, if you can bring it down to the everyday level, uh, you have the knowledge to speak at a very sophisticated level, but you can find the mix to bring it to where it, it, it registers with people. What I'm getting at is if somebody's uh, an expert witness before a, a committee in Frankfurt or a committee in Washington, DC, uh, if you're trying to get funding for something, uh, it doesn't matter how good you know the science if you can't communicate it, what that is going to do to help people. That's how you get your message across is by breaking down that science or that engineering. Uh, and I think, I think actually it, talking with some people, uh, we've got a really good dean, I think, at the College of Engineering, Rudy Buckheit. Uh, we've had some other great deans at the University uh, College of Engineering. But one of the things that they're very focused on these days is in training engineers is to to get them to be better at communicating what it is that they're doing so uh in the meantime i i sympathize with you natasha but i'm uh, i'm glad you're there to help and i think that's the if you can get people to crystallize it so they can understand it what it means what it can do for people or why that project's important then you're getting somewhere mm -hmm. And, and I do see, you know, some changes with the younger engineers. They have had more training with communications than, let's say, you know, com engineers that graduated perhaps in the 1970s or early 80s. I have seen a change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, Any last questions for Carl? Carl, I appreciate you being here today. I was a, once upon a time, I was at a Oh, I'll call it a press conference, but it really wasn't. Uh, one of the star tennis players, Madison Keys, who's played in Lexington and now you know, Wimbledon level. But she was in a group of, a small room with a group of young girls. They were maybe seventh, eighth grade girls. Oh, and they were just nervous as can be. Oh, I'm here with Madison Keys. You might as well be there with Babe Ruth, if you're a baseball fan. And they were so nervous that she didn't know, they didn't know what to ask her. And it was sort of a dull kind of a meeting gathering. And I was just a photographer and I didn't want to outstep my boundaries. But I wanted to say, Madison, ask them about themselves. What music's on their iPod? You know, where do they like to play? You know, involve them, engage them, just like you did, Carl. And I'm glad to see that you did that because it works. Uh, couldn't have said it better, Charlie. Excellent point. Excellent point. If if you're not going anywhere with a interview or sometimes I've I've been a guest a lecturer in communications or, or broadcast classes at University of Kentucky, and depending on the group, some groups they're they're really attentive and and involved and engaged from the get go, and sometimes you're not getting any questions, so you you start asking some questions of your own. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You think this will be recorded for those who didn't get to see it, David? Yes, yes. I think I think we have no problems. Uh, it 
my computer did a complete blink right there during uh, me reading his bio, and we've been good since. So I don't know what happened, but I think we should be okay with the recording. So I will uh, wrap everything up, and uh, in the next week, send out an email and let everybody know that the recording is available. And I'll get with Carl and try to get uh, those web links, uh, the web addresses that he was pointing out, and I'll share them on our, our website as well. So I think we are good. I will I'll be this. happy to. I'll, when I get off, I can email those to you. Perfect. Perfect. I'll post them for everybody so that they can get to them. I will say this, and Carl, this kind of applies to you. Our Awards of Excellence competition is open now. That, a, that call for entries has gone out. And Carl, I know you do a good bit of government communicating and quasi as it may be, but I know that uh, you certainly, or your group there, marketing communications could enter some of your better works if you'd like to. And so that is open. I hope that you received it and will share it with other communicators that aren't as active in the, in the organization, but we're looking forward to getting some good competition this year. And also, I don't know if who all is here that is on our fall committee or fall conference, but the, the conference committee is supposed to be gathering together and giving us some suggestions on what we might do this fall if the positivity rate drops. So far, that's not really happening like it was a, a month or so ago. So do we want to do it in person? Will your agencies even allow you to go? Do we want to do it virtually? And if so, how might that happen? So we're working on that. And so just stay tuned. Anything else, Charlie? I No, sir. I do want to share that our next uh, virtual lunch and learn will be June 16th. Um, and we are going to have somebody from the state library uh, join us. And they'll give an introductory session over what uh, services are available through the library, uh, which includes all of the county libraries, plus the state library, plus their Department of Library and Archives. Um, you're going to learn about their collections, how to access materials, and then spe uh, specific resources that they hold that may assist everyone in doing their job. So uh, an invite will come out for that in a, a week or so. Uh, but you can save the date June 16th. 